Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Our text this day is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 25. And our theme is, who will take away this burden of guilt? There's a little story about a husband and wife. They get into a discussion as to who should make coffee in the morning. The wife says to the husband, you should do it because you get up first and then we don't, you don't have to wait so long for your coffee. The husband says, no. He says, you're in charge of cooking around here. You should do it because I can wait for my coffee. The wife says, no, you should do it. And besides, it is in the Bible that the man should brew the coffee. Well, the husband says, I can't believe that. Show me how the Bible tells you that the husband is to brew coffee. So she opens up her Bible. She pages through it, comes to the, to the book of Philemon, and on the next pages after Philemon, at the top of the page, what do you read? He brews. <laughs> so, so now you got the answer, folks. Well, anyway, we look at our text this day, who will take away the, this burden of guilt? <clears throat> because in our lives, we have a burden of guilt. Because we stand before our God and before one another and before our world as sinners, as truly that we are in life. And so we read these words in the scriptures, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Very clearly, the scripture teaches us that we are all sinners and we all fall, fall short of the glory of God. We don't come up to God's expectations because of our sin. And we need to realize that always. And guilt really affects our mind and body. It affects us. Some people lose sleep over guilt and everything else. And, and sometimes people become ill because of the burden of guilt weighing upon their conscience and upon their minds and so forth. And so guilt really plays a, a difficult thing. And sometimes we imagine things because of our guilt at times in our lives. And so it, it's uh, got a, a few stories concerning that. A, a few, some years ago, Paul Harvey in his broadcast talked about there had been a sign put up on I-95 uh, coming into DeLand, uh, Florida. And somebody put up a sign there and said, narcotics inspection ahead. And when they saw that sign, some of the drivers, they would make an illegal U-turn right there. And what do you know? The cops were there to catch them, and so forth. And so we see that doing, we, sin always catches up with uh, us in one way or another. Or there's another story about a farmer. He buys a brand new car. And he's driving out into the country, you know. And he comes, he, he's on the road there, and he's, the driveway down to his house was right there, and everybody, but he decides he wants to try out his new car, see how fast it'll go. So he set, puts a foot down and he really goes down the highway at a fast rate of speed. And then he makes a sharp U-turn to come back. Well, there's another guy in a car, he's coming along, he sees that and he thinks it's, it's a cop there with, in an unmarked car. This guy gets scared and so he goes down this other road. He doesn't know that it's a dead end at the guy at the farmer's house. And then here the farmer comes with his car barreling right behind him. And the guy jumps out of his car and flees. And they find all kinds of merchandise in his car that he has stolen. You see, that's what guilt does to you sometimes. You imagine things in, in life and so forth. And that plays upon us human beings because guilt weighs upon us as we sin in our lives at, at all times. And so what do we do? Well... And people down through the centuries have offered sacrifices for their, uh, for their guilt, for their sins and so forth. God called upon the Israelites to make sacrifices. They did this a on a daily, weekly, and uh, different times. They did offer different sacrifices uh, for, their, for their sins and so forth. We see ancient cultures that don't have God's word at all. They felt guilt upon themselves. Uh, they, they have found that the, the Aztecs, which were advanced civilization that lived in Central and South America, but they have found in their temples, 
that they had, uh, they offered sacrifices for their, their guilt, their sins, and so forth. And they offered children, they offered de- people, they offered human beings as sacrifices to their gods. And so, yes, that's the feeling that we have, that we need to offer sacrifices uh, to, uh, to God. And what do we read in our text? It says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. <coughs> and so it's telling us here, yes, God had commanded his people to offer sacrifices in the temple for their sins and so forth. But those sacrifices never really took away their sins. And they didn't take away the sins of people in ancient cultures either that worship other gods. So the Lord calls on you and me then that we need to seek his forgiveness. We need to seek his forgiveness in our, in our life. And how do we do that? Well, sometimes people think that they got to punish themselves in order to really be, be on right terms with God and really be forgiven. It's said that former British Prime Minister William Gladstone that he kept a selection of whips in his cellar that he would whip himself with because he would feel guilty about this or that in his life. Some people, what what happens with kids, they feel guilty. They go to drinking and and alcoholism takes over in their life or drugs in their life. And sometimes that happens because people feel guilty. They're trying to atone for their own guilt, their own sins. And that's where we are driven as human beings sometimes in our lives. <clears throat> we need to always understand that we find forgiveness always at the foot of the cross because we need to, we, that's w- where we need to go. Otherwise, we don't find it. There's a, a story that Chuck Colson writes in one of his books, and it's, it, the story concerns an interview that ABC did with Albert Spears. Albert Spears was uh, one of Hitler's men, and, and he... Uh, spent 24 years in Spandau prison for his, for his war crimes. And he's the only one of the Nazis that admitted to his guilt and so forth and spent those years in Spandau uh, prison. And so in the interview, uh, David Hartman asked him, you have said the guilt can never be forgiven or shouldn't be. Do you still feel that way? In other words, Spear could, could, couldn't feel that he was uh, not guilty anymore. I ser- he said this, I served a sentence of 20 years and I could say I'm a free man. My conscience has been cleared by serving the whole time as punishment. But I cannot do that. I still carry the burden of what happened to millions of people during Hitler's lifetime. And I can't get rid of it. This new, this new book is part of my atoning of clearing my conscience. Then Hartman asked him, you really don't think you'll be able to clear it totally? And Spear says, I don't think it will be possible. That's where this man is. After all those years of spending in prison, he still feels so guilty that he doesn't feel he, he can be forgiven. And Colson says he wanted to write him and tell him about Jesus Christ and his salvation there, but Spear died before he was able to do that. My friends, we need to understand that we cannot atone for our own sins. We cannot uh, have free a free uh, conscience before our God on our own. We need help. We need help very much so. We need the grace of God. That's what we need in our lives, the grace of God in our lives and his love in our lives if we are to feel that we are are forgiven and that we can stand before our God. And that's always an important thing, that we understand that God truly loves us in this way. A little story about a guy driving down the road and a car clips him clips his fender and it's a young woman and she's driving a brand new car it's only two days old this car and here she's she's clipped this other guy and they stop and she admits that she's wrong and so forth and she's in tears over the whole thing well the guy says you know we have to exchange you know uh, addresses and so forth and driver's license numbers and those kinds of things you know for this and so she goes to her glove compartment opens her gloves compartment to get out the material she needs for that. And there she has a a slip of paper right there in front of her. And this is what the slip of paper uh, says. It's uh, something from her husband. And it's in this. It says, in case of accident, remember, honey, it's you I love, not the car. 
Now, that might not happen to all of us, in other words, that the husband says that. But anyway, that's what this husband said. But it's true that that's where his love needed to be. And that's what God says to you and me. He's, it's you I love, not your sin, not the things you've done wrong. It's you I love, Jesus says to you and me. And we need to understand that in our life that he does truly love us. The Old Testament priests, they offer sacrifices over and over again. And what do we read in our uh, scripture here? But these sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's what he, the writer here of Hebrews says. So they could not take away your sins. It had to be more than just blood and goats and, and, and so forth and, and that that would truly take away our sins. And what takes away our sins? It's none other than Jesus Christ. It's none other than the Son of God who came into this world as a human being to atone for our sins. He is the one that went to a cross and he suffered and died there on that cross for you and for me and for all uh, people in this world that have ever lived and ever will live. Jesus died on that cross. And so we read in our text these words, but when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. One sacrifice. That's the one, that one sacrifice that does it for all time, for all people. That Jesus Christ, as he went to that cross, he atoned for our sins. And then he rose again from the dead. He's that living Lord that's overcome all things for us. And so we read this in our scripture. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And they, where th these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. There is a complete forgiveness. He says there's no more sacrifice for sin. Christ has done it all. And that's where you and I find our freedom. That's where we find our joy to know that we are forgiven and that we, we stand before our God forgiven as we come to him and trust in Jesus as our Savior. And that's wonderful news for us. <clears throat> and Christ's atonement made, paved the way for you and me. Paul says in 1 Timothy these words, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Yes. And so then what do we need to do? Listen to what our, our text says, says, says. Let us hold unswerving to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. He's telling us he's faithful. You can trust what God says to you. And he goes on. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We need to spur one another on. That's a critically important thing. We are here to uplift and strengthen one another in our life with God, in our life in this world that we live from day to day. Or he goes on in our text and says this, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What is he saying there? He's saying here, as he writes here in the first century AD, He's saying some are not coming to church anymore. Some aren't coming to worship anymore. And here we live in the year of 2015 today, and we would have to say, you know, not everybody's here. We got a lot of empty pews. So not everybody is gathering together either today to worship the Lord, just as they weren't in his day either. But what does he say? Encourage one another. Encourage one another, because together then you can live the Christian life. Together you do not fall. We need each other. And so we need to encourage one another to be at worship. Encourage one another that we come before the Lord to hear his word. Encourage one another to come to the sacrament and so forth so that we truly can live that Christian life and have that wonderful news always that Jesus loves us, that Jesus forgives us, and that we can stand before our God as righteous people only through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, yes, let our challenge be, you will always find forgiveness at the foot of the cross as you trust in Christ as your Savior. So keep that in mind. And remember what he says here. Don't, don't be ones that want to not come together anymore to worship. We want to be together here always to worship our Lord. May his blessing be with each of us. Amen. At this time, we will make confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the Father
familiar of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers this day, we pray for uh, uh, Holly and Tom Ger Gerard and the family on Holly.